Yeah. Oh, oh. So, yes, you can hear me well, I think. Uh, we will be starting on time, um, despite the fact that the audience has difficulties waking up. But <laughs> just for the record, if you have some friends willing to attend and they couldn't, I just heard we were recorded, so we will be available online. Um, I am completely uh, and 100% um, delighted to be on these panels uh, with all the speakers we have here. This um, topic of accountability tools from transfers to cross-border interoperability, this topic came from a discussion with members from this panel who are just thinking, oh gosh, what do you think? We have so many problems with setting up our accountability program and it means so much and we have some kind of outcomes that are really valid ones and is there somehow a way to bridge between you know this accountability program and all the safeguards it brings materially speaking concretely operationally and the guarantees we have to provide so that we transfer data safely from a country to another and this was somehow the the beginning of such a panel discussion um, I will present the speaker, um, and I'm delighted we have a diversity of um, angles, opinions, and this is what will be enriching our discussion today. Um, I will then also uh, highlight that please do not expect from this panel to discuss shrimps or anything dealing with whatever would be, you know, standard conversation. The aim of this panel is just bridging between accountability programs or highlighting how accountability steps taken by, um, again, accountable controllers and processes can help facilitate data transfers and the demonstration that those are, you know, confidential, safe and compliant. Uh, those takeaways were described. I will directly start with an introduction by alphabetic order, because I don't want to be biased. So, Boyana Bellamy, uh, for those not knowing, Boyana, she's the president of the Center for Information Policy Leadership. As you can see, um, I took the, the content from, you know, uh, available public uh, content online. And as you can see, you know, mission number one for Boyana is bridging. And I think it's the first summary of what you do and try to accomplish bridging between, you know, the business and the regulators, uh, between the need for data protection and all the fundamental rights. Uh, and I will uh, keep uh, uh, going on and on, but I will not. And I will switch to Nicola. We are delighted to have you, Nicola. You are the head of um, International Transfers and BCI Unit uh, in, the, in the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. Uh, it's been several years. You are an expert on this topic and we'll be delighted to have your views from both the Irish and more you know, broader scope of uh, the EDPB approach. Uh, we have also speaking here, and I'm sorry I didn't have the, the picture available. I took, the, you know, the data released online. Uh, we have uh, Morgan Dons. Uh, I heard now is not part of DCMS anymore because it's rebranded in Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. Uh, it's been several years you've been working for UK government overall, and you're obviously now in charge of um, uh, transfers for UK. Uh, our fourth panelist is Fabrice Nastalski, and uh, you are a partner at EY, um, and you've been delving into those issues or challenges more than issues, um, more than 20 years supporting customers and having this huge expertise, and we are delighted to have you here. I will start moderating myself and not speaking before the speakers, but let me highlight, if you didn't, that uh, I was flagged notably by Fabrice contributing, and I know, Boyana, you did too, this OECD report d dated um, April 27, released this year, and uh, the name of which is Moving Forward on Data Free Flow with Trust. Mm -hmm. I was referred to it like a couple of days ago, and actually I've been reading it all, and it's not so long, but it's a state of play on data transfers, concrete practices, <coughs> and guess what? Accountability is suggested among the ways forward. There are six identified as number one way forward. So I was mm -hmm. just thinking, wow, we are mm -hmm. spot on. Uh, but I will refrain then um, having more references. Please go and, 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 and have a look at that because it's really interesting. Um, just for the record, before I give the floor to the speakers, we will potentially, if they want, uh, panelists will refer to the meta decision. It's not a topic today. As I said, you know, we are an accountability and transfers topic um, to be discussed uh, now, but it's not really about that. But please feel free in the Q&A time uh, to, you know, bring some specific point around that. Um, I will start giving the floor to Fabrice uh, and asking a simple 
apparently, but in fact really complex question, which is um, how do you think Fabrice challenges evolved around, you know, for companies, uh, around data transfers based on your experience, notably on BCRs and others. Um, how would you re re summarize the best practices? And um, b based on your um, experience and all the feedback you had from your customers, um, are you somehow convinced, and if so, how, that accountability is part of what data transfers um, accomplishment and, 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 and outcomes should be? Thanks, uh, Marie-Charlotte, for, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be with, with you on, on this panel. Um, yes, I will start with, with the, the notion of accountability. Uh, accountability has been uh, endorsed by, by GDPR in, in order to promote better uh, compliance on the ground. Uh, we, we, with a view also to reflect the risk-based approach, which yes. is one of the yes. big innovation from, from, uh, from GDPR, uh, in a context of where transfer is still one of the biggest challenges for privacy uh, pro professionals. So I, I, will, I will focus, uh, to respond to, to your question, Marie-Charlotte, I will focus on the accountability-driven me mechanism. If we, st if, we, um, if we define accountability, to have accountability or a compliance program, you need first a legal framework. The legal framework can be defined by, by legislation or the, or the legal framework can be defined by a, an, an organization like in uh, international organizations. And, and you need to, to uh, implement these uh, legal frameworks by dissemination of the rule of law uh, by, uh, by de developing a set of uh, mechanism, tools, in order to, to train, in order to, to explain uh, the, the, the rule, and in order to, to monitor proper compliance uh, on the, the, the ground. Uh, so th that's the, the common tools we, 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 we observe in, in compliance <coughs> program. And so the idea is to focus on a transfer mechanism which are driven by, by accountability, uh, accountability rules. And when you, you have a, a look to Article 46, you can see that the expectations from uh, uh, lawmakers is to, to implement appropriate safe, safeguards. That's the, the, the main objective in order to have a um, legal um, data transfers, uh, the, the fact that it is um, that there are data subject rights enforceable, the fact that there are effective legal remedies is not in the remit of international groups, that's, that's more in, in the remi remit of, of, of governments. And, and so the, in the mechanism uh, which reflect accountability within GDPR from our experience are first the EU binding corporate rules and the uh, EU certification and code of conduct uh, mechanism which, which are very new. So I will more insist uh, on the first one a and it's interesting to compare it also to the uh, APEC uh, cross-border privacy rules uh, uh, mechanism which has commonalities with both the EY, uh, EU uh, binding corporate rules and the uh, EU uh, C CDPR certification uh, approach. So if I start with the, um, maybe I will take, the <laughs> thanks, Mark Charles. If I, I start with, with, with BCRs, that's a, a very mature tools. We, we, we started to, to draft this year 24 uh, years uh, ago, so that's something which exists for a very long time, and Boyana knows that, because Boyana was on the, yeah. one of the first to, to, to draft. No, uh, I, I was not, I was very in school then, it wasn't <laughs> me, it was somebody else. I was in school 24 years ago, so. Uh, no, no, that's not 20, you are, it's 14, 14, 14 years, exactly. right. so, so, so It was another <laughs> thanks, Boyana. Thanks, thanks yeah. to correct me. Uh, <laughs> but, um, um, so to come back, so, so <laughs> by any corporate rules, um, our, our compliance program, uh, which have already a, a lot of, uh, uh, on which we, there is a lot of uh, experience for, for, for companies, uh, and uh, it's 
programs uh, that are st still ongoing. Uh, the, maybe w one first remark is that groups which decided to move forward on BCRs uh, 14 years ago still are working, are, are dealing with their transfers using the, their binding corporate rules. And what we also observe is that you are more and more frameworks which uh, recognize the binding corporate rules as an appropriate safeguard to export data from non-EU country, from their own country to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It is uh, mm -hmm. in middle in the Emirates, for, for instance, in the uh, Abu Dhabi global market uh, legislation, you have a, a sort of copy-paste. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, too long. Uh, so maybe just to say that there is a many uh, new frameworks which recognize the, the, the binding uh, co corporate rules. Um, one of the main challenge of, of uh, binding corporate rules uh, is, is the fact uh, that as of today, there, there is a, a feeling that uh, from the regulator side, there are limited uh, incentives uh, or limited um, recognition of efforts of groups um, in, in the dealing of data transfers, meaning that, for instance, uh, groups having uh, binding corporate rules are subject to the same level of constraints regarding, for instance, the performance of data transfer impact assessment as other, uh, other data exporters. I will insist on, on the question from, from uh, Marie-Charlotte uh, about uh, the, the tips uh, in order to, to implement uh, binding corporate rules uh, within a, a group. What is very successful is to brand the, the BCRs as a global compliance uh, accountability uh, program which reflects most of existing uh, legislation. Uh, that's really something we, which permits to to disseminate this type of mechanism within the, 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 the group. It's also a consistency uh, enabler because when you present the BCRs <coughs> as the best EU practice, it's not very popular. You have half of companies which will be very reluctant to move forward considering that they are not directly subject to, to, to GDPR. So that's a, a, another layer of constraints. But in practice, if you present BCRs as a consistency a, a, a enabler, very close to what already exists in many frameworks, that's something which will help a lot to implement the, the BCRs. We also observe that most groups use the yearly compliance self-assessment, which permit also to monitor the implementation of the, the binding uh, uh, corporate rules. And, and maybe externally, because it's also very important, many clients are considering that it is a deal accelerator because binding corporate rules is very well known by the market. So when, when they, they have binding corp corporate rules, that's something we, which helps in the negotiation with business partners. And maybe a last, uh, last uh, word on, on this. There is a, a strong movement from uh, ESG rating agencies, uh, Standard & Poor's, for instance, uh, include uh, compliance with uh, cyber security, but also privacy rules uh, as, a, as a key um, key component of its own uh, rating. Uh, and so this year is part of the mechanism which are very well known uh, by, uh, um, by uh, rating agencies, but also public donors. <coughs> and we know that, uh, uh, we know that the DG budget, for instance, when they lend, uh, when they finance international organizations, they will also check the existence of a legal framework and the way the legal framework is uh, e e e implemented. Uh, I don't know if I have time for certification. One 30, minute. 30 seconds. 30 <laughs> seconds. So certification uh, is starting as the first uh, GDPR uh, certification scheme has been uh, approved uh, la last uh, October and, and many companies are starting to, to work on, on this. Uh, the only missing component is the accredited certification bodies, but uh, it, will, it will come very soon. Uh, Accredia, which is 
the Federation of Normalization uh, body in, uh, in Italy has started to perform accreditation of certification bodies. So we, we expect certification to start in a very short uh, time frame. Uh, it's also a very interesting uh, uh, approach uh, permitting uh, to uh, data importer to demonstrate their, their compliance when this scheme will be extended according to Article 46. But uh, maybe I will continue uh, a bit later during the discussion because or maybe I will ask you a question. Did you notice that GDPR in any way five years ago changed the game? Is there a kind of impact of the GDPR on how BCRs and the way they are implemented um, works? I mean. um, GDPR has changed the way uh, by uh, promoting accountability and, and, and in 2011 when Article 29 working party drafted its uh, first uh, working paper on uh, accountability. You have two pages with ex which explain already that binding corporate rules was uh, the best in class uh, mechanism in order to reflect uh, the uh, accountability uh, uh, mechanism. So I think uh, BCRs is also uh, boosting um, or encouraging the move toward uh, uh, binding corporate rules, even if there are some uh, uh, some uh, um, some issues uh, may be connected to 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 the, the level of granularity expected within the content of of, of of BCRs, which is very very and more and more demanding. That's what we observe, uh, and what the feedback we, we get from 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 clients. But that's something which can be discussed because it's also uh, the, the level of granularity is, is good for transfer uh, tracking and is also also good to reinforce the, uh, the instruments of uh, accountability. But that's something we will discuss a bit later. And, and actually picking the brains of Boyana on that quickly, do you share mm -hmm. the same view as, Fab as Fabrice? I, I, I saw you nodding. So Yes. Oh, gosh. I, I, I share so much, um, so, so many similar things with Fabrice because we have known each other for 14 years, as he says. But um, no, I, I think GDPR has had the right intention. You know, we talk a lot, it's five years of GDPR. Like, where, what kind of five-year-old child is this GDPR? It had an amazing intention and the spirit, but I feel that accountability has been a little bit forgotten, mm -hmm. right? It was included in GDPR in terms of building compliance program, demonstrating that you are accountable. It's been there, as you say, in terms of accountable data transfer tools, uh, but we haven't seen very much development in there. What we have seen is actually focus on on, on something else which companies cannot really effectuate. So, so I, I find this a bit disappointing, and I find, you know, there were uh, there were lots of companies and regulators in the Commission who were real pioneers and buccaneers uh, at the time when we were building BCR, when we were building referential between CBPR and BCR. There was so much enthusiasm, and now everybody's scared to actually do anything. It's right, like we f I feel we feel constrained because it has become so much higher stakes. Everything is potentially judicially reviewed. Activists want to bring everything down, and we are stopping the progress and innovation in lawmaking uh, because we are worried. So that's my reaction on GDPR. But and yeah. I will jump on it on yes. this occasion yeah. to bring Morgan yeah. in because UK dares and is bold enough. Yeah. So is it your starting point, meaning um, Fabrice's description of the state of play? Is it where you started from in your reflection around, you know, like accountability and those transfer tools? Um, I think it's connected. So I think we started in um, uh, in the UK. <coughs> um, actually, you can find it in the national data strategy that we have that we published in 2020, which covers kind of the approach to uh, to our data policy, including data protection. And I think that the kind of the headline and the spirit of the national data strategy and all the work that we're doing in the UK is moving away from data being a risk to be guided against to data as an opportunity uh, to benefit from, because <coughs> we are living in data-driven societies. Everyone is heavy, like relying on data, businesses, economy economies, individuals who communicate. Um, I mean, obviously, during the COVID, we saw like how much um, uh, kind of collaboration and data transfers were important for uh, life-saving uh, research and vaccines and so on. So I think it's just kind of the spirit of it was just kind of, as Brianna said, just kind of um, uh, moving away from the risks and, 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 and moving away from kind of, um, uh, especially companies being uh, afraid of doing anything or and to really kind of focus on the outcome, which is privacy and allowing company to uh, innovate with uh, higher data 
protection standards. So in the UK, uh, we have a we are reforming the UK GDPR. Uh, um, uh, um, I think the, the the it's fair to say that it's a revolution and an evolution. We are kind of applying uh, kind of the lesson learned from five years and kind of of implementation, um, but we do retain accountability. And actually, in some respect, we enhance accountability yes. yeah. in the in um, in in the bill. So for instance, uh, just quite one quick example to to uh, to show that is uh, we don't require a necessarily organization to have a data protection officer. We re require organization to uh, appoint a, a senior responsible official uh, to, uh, to kind of monitor kind of uh, compliance uh, and privacy. And that means that we put privacy at the heart of the organization, at the top of the organization. And this is where we can re we enhance uh, uh, accountability. So rather than being too prescriptive about mandating uh, who has to uh, do uh, compliance accountability, we're trying to kind of make sure it's at the heart of, of, of companies. When we're looking at applying to um, uh, tools uh, and transfer tools, I think, you know, even though we are reforming the UK GDPR, it's very much, uh, we still kind of retain the principle of GDPR. Um, as I said, so we have the same uh, tools, we have the same contracts, we have BCRs as well. I think what I wanted to say on, on, on this point is, um, when we were consulting on the on the reform, we had like 3,000 responses, we consulted with businesses and experts and so on. Um, BCRs are considered at the moment like the, the golden standard of yeah. GDPR, and they're quite costly and time consuming to implement. Um, so what we've kind of focused on uh, in the UK, including with the uh, Information Commissioner's Office, is to try to streamline the process as much as possible and to help the, the businesses uh, in the in the <coughs> in the process when they, they put in to get uh, set up uh, BCRs to incentivize uh, the use of BCRs. Uh, so for instance, we kind of uh, already the ICO kind of reformed the uh, and streamlined the process by um, requiring businesses. To only submitting uh, required documentation once and not several times, uh, and we're still working to kind of uh, make improvement on, on that. Um, so I think in terms of uh, the kind of the the the, um, the, the topic of accountability uh, in the UK, we're just like trying to make sure that you know the tools that we are using are uh, as efficient and easy to use uh, as possible for businesses to incentivize their 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 adoption at the moment. Thank you, and I think it's really good because we have, as I said, different angles, and we. Yeah. Uh, not a 360 view, but, but but really, you know, comprehensive view. So I'm switching to you, Nicola. Just having the same spirit, you've been working um, for the Irish Data Protection Commissioners on BCRs and now globally on transfers for years, and of course contributing to the DPB reflections. What is your, you know, fair summary of where we stand and how you think accountability is part and and, and somehow you know core and center to all those data transfers checks. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mary Charlotte. Um, I actually agree with something Bayana said about accountability kind of being forgotten. It was hailed as this novelty when the GDPR was announced accountability, but when you when you bring it back to BCRs, which is you know my expertise and my experience in monitoring with BCRs. It's at the core. You know, there there is a section in the referential accountability where they're actually asked to describe and make commitments to uh, the applicant companies um, to, to the tenets of accountability within the BCR and everybody is signed up to that. Um, but we probably don't frame it as, as this big accountability tool, which I think maybe is a failing and, and something, something we, mm. it's something certainly I would probably bring to the conversation that I've been uh, um, moved to think about it in, in, that, in, that, um, in that way. But on the monitoring side, my experience is that the companies that, that are tuned into the need for accountability and have their ducks in a row, so to speak, are the ones who can probably submit and successfully achieve a BCR approval in the quickest possible way because they already have the framework in place, they already have the policies, they already are transparent, they already have their records of processing, they know where their transfers are going, why they're going, who they're going to, who the data subjects are, because all of that has to be recorded in a BCR. And I know it's, it is hailed as the gold standard and it's, it is a very onerous pro process and it, it does probably shut out some of the smaller um, organisations and that's something that probably we as, as regulators and the EGPV as a whole and, and possibly the European Commission need to look at going <coughs> forward uh, of ways that, to bring BCRs in, in as a, for companies who are 
accountable and who are um, GDPR compliant and are probably able to demonstrate it fully but, but don't have maybe the resources or maybe don't consider that they're big enough or the transfers are significant enough to warrant a BCR. Um, but I, I do bring it back to the BCRs that we do have and the companies that we are dealing with. We're monitoring with the applications we have and then also post approval to see that the, the, that the, the, the commitments they've made are actually um, continuing and it wasn't just a paper exercise, a very expensive paper exercise, but it actually was, um, it is something that's living. So we in DPC in particular, I'm, I'm not, I can't say this for every regulator, but we are very, very hot on the annual update on really probing the companies to see what changes have been made. Are you still demonstrating uh, that compliance, we make them, you know, confirm things in writing, we check um, if there's wording changes, we, we, we go back and ask why is that, you know, are you still compliant, are you trying to swerve something here or is, or is there a reason for this? And I think it's, it's, it is paying dividends because the BCRs holders are understanding that this is not just a big, huge document that you have to get through this huge process, but it is actually bringing all those policies, all this <coughs> accountability tenets together and making it a living, breathing thing that um, ensures that you can have compliant transfers. And it's supposed to be, and it is worth it. It obviously is worth it because companies would not spend that money to get a BCR and deal with us regulators and all the red tape that it entails if it wasn't worth it financially and, and from mm -hmm. commercially mm -hmm. for them. Absolutely. And I think going forward, if if accountability is, is brought to the forefront and BCRs are tied in with global CBPRs mm -hmm. or they're tied in with certification as a whole mm -hmm. suite of, mm -hmm. of tools that can be used for accountability, it, they'll mm -hmm. be even more attractive for companies because you'll be seen as best in best in practice if you have a BCR in your name. Um, I saw it described, you know, some, I was looking up sort of, you know, different uh, explanations for accountability and I saw some, someone mention something about internal clarity and I thought that was kind of a good, a good uh, description of Yes. What we ask in the BCRs, and even with the new referential on the controller BCR, it, it, there's actually a part where the a parent level, board level person has to sign a cert certifying basically that what's in this document is is actually what's happening, and that's they're they're being account held accountable then afterwards. So I think we've had a bit of criticism maybe with the even with the new referential that it's even more onerous and more detailed and more probing. But in my experience, and this, this update was based on our experience dealing with these BCRs, um, a lot of the changes were necessary to, to spell out where, where companies are going wrong and how, why it's taken so long is because you're, 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 you're failing to meet your, um, your requirements under these areas, such as transparency or, or, or making commitments to do DPIAs or, or wording about data subject rights or your liability or, or all of that. So I do feel that this is, you know, as I said, it's made me think about accountability as a whole, but I think actually maybe going forward, framing the BCR framework as highlighting the accountability side yes. of it would probably yes. make it a lot more attractive. Yes. And it's something that um, I'd certainly bring back to the table in discussions with the EGPB. And thank you, and I, and I cannot resist because I, we wanted to be operational and practical, so I jump on this question because you refer to what could be done for SMEs potentially. Mm -hmm. Is it something you think because of being that onerous and time consuming, that could be some kind of a second version or iteration of BCRs for, you know, somehow making it possible for SMEs to have an accountability program that would be available, you know, at their scale, I would say. Mm -hmm. Do you think that at Irish level or EU level, that could be a reflection around that? Or There's, I think we've been asked so many times, I, I think it can't be ignored for much longer that, that, that is, um, the process maybe is cutting out a huge portion of, of businesses and organisations um, as it stands. Obviously, the EGPB and, and processes, um, it could take some time, but it's certainly, it's certainly something that we're seeing again and again <coughs> in, in meetings, in forums, and even in 
uh, submissions to the EDPB and to to us in DPC. Um, uh, you know, it, it comes up time and time again. So while I can't say yes, definitely, it's it's certainly something I would be open to discussing and uh, and putting forward um, my thoughts on. And I will uh, pick the brains of Fabrice and Boyana um, on what you just said. Um, if you have some comments on what Nicolas has been sharing. I, I start, uh, so it's true, uh, as of today, I'm a bit skeptical uh, that this year can be as such uh, implemented by, by SMEs, because mm -hmm. the level of expectation is, is very, uh, is very, uh, is very high. So uh, if we want to be very pragmatic and very practical, uh, I, I think it would be better to have uh, Maybe uh, another this year's format for, for, for this year. Of course, uh, the, the level of accountability, uh, the tools will, will, will be similar. But, he, he, but w w when you read the last uh, this year's uh, uh, EDPB uh, guidance, it's very detailed. You have to, to indicate how many audits you, you will perform per year. Uh, you have to indicate uh, the details of your training program, so it's good for accountability. But I'm not sure it's it's really uh, it's really uh, compatible. it's compatible <laughs> with, with uh, the resources uh, that SMEs uh, have in place. So maybe it would be interesting to to explore uh, maybe in uh, in sandbox uh, other other approaches which will be more uh, um, adapted to, to, to the SME's environment, even if it is a, as, as such a, a good mindset. Bojana. Yeah, uh, so I have a few comments. Um, I, I like, Nicola, very much where you're going, and, and, and thank you for actually taking these things back to EDPB. I think we, we want to um, incentivize more BCR. We can't make them the same as SECs. We can't make them more onerous than SECs, but they're becoming more onerous. Fabrice, you're absolutely right. And look what companies are asked to do to show that they're best in class and to have CBPR, whereas if you have SECs, you have to do none, nothing. You just sign a contract mm -hmm. and put it in the, in the virtual filing system, right? So, so that is, and that's okay because BCR is accountability, but you know, SEC also must be accountability. If you sign something, you have to commit that you will implement this on the other side of the world. Um, so I think what, what we need to do is, is several things. First of all, we need to, you've said this, said this, Nicola, we have to make a link between BCR, Article 24 accountability, and certifications in GDPR. Like that link hasn't been made, but companies see it as, as one. And let me explain this. I work with so many companies. I was working at big global companies. Companies have got a single privacy program, which actually tells and dictates how they comply around the world. And that program is based on often on GDPR with some other requirements, bit of LGPD in Brazil, bit of US specificities, bit of something in Korea and so on. And they use that single program to comply wherever. And that program is the basis for BCR. And in fact, that program is often basis for Privacy Shield as well. I mean, that if you talk to companies who have actually done all, they've used the same program to obtain different certifications, Shield in US, BCR approval in EU, and even CBPR certifications in APEC. We will talk about CBPR separately. But I want to talk about, so that's what BCR is. BCR is used, Fabrice, you said this, as a B2B, um, uh, um, uh, sort of confidence building. You know, businesses are asking you, have you got BCRs? It's, it's almost like, have you got ISO certification? Mm -hmm. So that's what it has become. So de facto, it's becoming like a certification, but it doesn't work like certification. And the certifications under uh, uh, GDPR do not allow certification of privacy program, which is actually BCR, mm -hmm. you see? But it's the same thing. We, we certify that perhaps my HR system works or my particular website works, but it's actually the ability to have privacy program the way, as you know, CIPL has been working so much on accountability and what are the elements of privacy program. And if you look at the seven elements, it's exactly what BCR is. So why don't we recognize and certify companies' ability to have a privacy program based on whatever, right? And that will be huge, huge step forward. So I think that really is important. Um, 
SMEs, look, SMEs can't do BCR. If SME is just one company operating a startup after one, one country send, sending data to another one, there's no incentive. What does BCR do? It enables a large enterprise that actually has got many entities globally to share data within the same group. But here is how it can evolve in the future. If I am BCR certified as a company X, and you are BCR certified as company Z, why can't we share data between ourselves? Because both of us are actually um, seen as uh, responsible data stewards. There's no reason why it can't be like that. I mean, that's what Privacy Shield is. You certify that you do Privacy Shield. Here, you get to prove that you do the best in class BCR. So no matter who sends you data, no matter where you get the data, it should be allowed to you because you've got the BCR. And if I'm BCR, you're BCR, that should be allowed as well. And there is, uh, GDP allows for that it, because it allows BCR to be used as a transfer mechanism between um, en entities, undertakings in joint, uh, sorry, undertakings again engaged in joint economic activity. I mean, that's what it is, right? So if I'm, I, so we need to be bold and think, um, think sort of further. Um, so, you know, um, Final point, um, Cisco uh, has, does a great survey, which I encourage you all to look at. What are the benefits of privacy management program, right? Um, and yearly they ask what people around the world, what, how, does that, uh, record, how does that translate in ROI? And in fact, this year, we actually partnered with them and we did the same with SIPL members, which are kind of the most advanced companies. And there's no doubt that people do privacy, not because it, of course, to comply with the law, of course, to uh, avoid fines, but they do it also because it's good for business, it enables them to be more smooth, to be more effective. And in fact, um, uh, certifications are seen as a very good way forward because it gives you a, some kind of a stamp of approval and the BCR is that sort of certification, it's a stamp of approval. Of course, we would like to see more certifications, we would like to see more codes of conduct. I know there is scope, I think, in, in the room here, uh, cloud, cloud um, uh, code of conduct and ability to transfer data. These are also accountability mechanisms. So it's not just BCR, but I do feel that we have to do more to actually salvage and save this very good accountability mechanism. And I will uh, keep you, you know, <coughs> um, sharing with us because um, I wanted just to take your feedback and, and reflection based on a few years of discussion around CBPRs and of course you've been exchanging the frame of UK discussions and lately CIPL has been working on PETS mechanisms so it's a big mix um, but uh, I would like to get your views and potentially based on what you just shared with us uh, in a few minutes just knowing where do you think certification stands and I think CBPR initiative is really interesting switching from mm -hmm. a regional to a global approach in which in fact we have the mechanism you described in which you care about uh, a sender you know yes. and a receiver and yes. do they have practices that safeguard and, and makes data you know secured so could you yeah share on, on those points Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, me. Okay, okay, right. Okay. So, CB yes, you're right. CBPR is a certification based mechanism. The difference between CBPR and BCI is that uh, it, it, BCI is within the group of companies for the moment. As I've explained, it can be made into something else. CBPR is not. CBPR says if you have got certain privacy program and compliance in place, you will get certified by third party accountability agent. It's an auditor, could be NY, you know, could be anybody. Um, and if you comply with all these program requirements, which you will see are very similar to BCR and GDPR, you actually get the certification, then you can transfer data. And of course, as you're transferring, you of course have got contracts, you've got accountability, but you can also receive data, and, and that's the benefit of CBPR. At the moment, it's a, it was an APEC system, it has gone global, I think it has got a huge potential. There is criticism of it, of course, that it doesn't quite in the substance. So you have to differentiate the substance of CBPR. Mm -hmm. What do you have to comply to? What are the requirements? So that has to be bridged with B GDPR and LGPD and other rules. They have to be similar in substance. CIPL has done a mapping of GDPR, CBPR, Privacy Shield, 64%, but that doesn't mean it's lower. It just means some way it's different, right? CBPR does not recognize legitimate interest, only consent. So you may say there, they go higher than GDPR, but no, they just need to be 
upgraded, right? I think that's, that's the point here. So, so you have to differentiate the substantive uh, mapping versus procedural. Procedural, there's nothing wrong with CBPR. It's a third party, accredited accountable agents, similar to certifications, that certifies this company and does it yearly. To your point, Nicola, they do it yearly, so there is a review. Interestingly, when I speak to accountability agents, they say to me that there are lots of SMEs who are certifying with CBPR in APAC and, and Japan, Korea, because they actually find it helpful to have somebody hand-holding them through this certification and say, have you done this, have you done that, have you done that? And even though you're limited, you don't operate globally, you are accountable, you are certifiable, you can be trusted to transfer and to receive data. So you see there is a potential there to, to be built. I'm encouraged by um, CBPR becoming global now. There are more countries interested, there are more companies interested, but companies need to understand why would I do this? Why is this going to help me? It can't be yet another burdensome tool, please. You know, we, we need streamlining. They want one-stop shop for data transfers. So we have to work towards that multilateral solution. So I'm encouraged that UK government has decided to be the associate member to observe to um, uh, you know, champion and, and debate. And we need to work together to kind of raise this standard so that we can bridge between GDPR certifications and adequacy and CBPR. But I'll stop. I mean, this could be a topic on its own panel. We should have it set next year or, you know. And I think it's really, so I will potentially have some targeted question to you, Nicola, maybe, because when we were listening to the panelists, it kind of cor corroborates what I think, which is, materially speaking, the content of BCR is really clear. It's really demanding, but it's really a good mapping. And on the structures, the mechanism, CBPR evolution being global is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So is there a chance there would be an evolution at EU level for tools such as BCRs becoming global or available globally, mm -hmm. meaning you could, you know, getting certified somehow? Um, I'd say, and it, uh, as it stands, we're seeing more and more applications that are global. You can see they're trying to, the wording, they're trying to cover all, all the bases um, that, so they can use them globally. So I think the next step, uh, now, we, when we receive a documentation like that, um, we do, we assess the GDPR component and, and the compliance with the GDPR and, if the, B, and the BCR referentials. We don't look at the global um, component, but obviously it can be used. They've got, once they get their authorization from the EDPB and a positive opinion um, that it's, it's all approved, um, I would imagine that would ha carry some weight as regards uh, globally. But the next step, the natural, probably next step is maybe to look at, like Bayana was saying about, you know, doing that mapping exercise on the substance, trying to match them and bring them closer together, looking at mm -hmm. you know, the bindingness mm -hmm. um, elements and, and seeing where, like, uh, there's probably substance elements that don't need to be matched because they're not crucial, but there are other. So it's, mm -hmm. it's identifying those elements maybe that yeah. that do need to be matched first and prioritizing mm -hmm. trying to bring those into compliance. And I think that might be a next good step um, to bring and to open up the conversation yeah. then yeah. politically pushing it from uh, all sides as well. So, so because our work is informed by, we're told, you know, some a request comes in and we're told to put this on our agenda for 2024 or whatever, and the assessment will be done at the EDP subgroup level. So I think the will, to the push needs to come from uh, higher. Can I ask, would there be, would you see a possibility for kind of mutual recognition? I mean, Fabrice, you said that there are many laws that recognize BCR, for example, today. Take BCR, so why wouldn't, including UK GDPR, of course, EU, Brazil recognizes CBPR, or Singapore enables this as well. Why wouldn't between these countries this be possible? If you've got BCR approval in Europe, well, then you can use that as well from Singapore, from Brazil, in the UK. Why do we need to go through all of these regulators together again? And by the way, it's the topic of the panel, interoperability. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? I mean, it's... The, the push, I don't know where the push is not coming from or why, where the resistance is coming from, um, but it seems to make sense when all of these 
areas are, are, are basically aiming for the same endpoint, um, why would, would there not be some mutual recognition and um, it's certainly conversations that need to be opened um, because we're coming to the end of say updating the BCR referentials and we're looking forward why leave it as a stagnating tool yeah, it yeah. should be it should be opened yeah. up and that's how I would see it. Thank you and I, I will switch it's, it's really the perfect segue to go to you Morgan and and the UK approach so basically we'll discuss about other points in the Q&A but I think it's really where you stand now that we want to observe because you have this um, you know, brand new approach, creative approach, solution making approach, and I would say practical approach that sometimes we do not push that much. So would you share with us please now where you stand and how you see all those tools, accountability, certification, and how UK is going to evolve around that? Um. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and thank you for uh, recognizing the pragmatism. That's what we're trying to do anyways. I think we've heard so many feedbacks from you know, businesses uh, of all sizes uh, struggling to uh, uh, comply or uh, thinking that they are spending too much time in, in tick box uh, exercise rather than just actually thinking about accountability that we really tried in our kind of domestic legislation uh, reform and, and a wider kind of engagement to kind of look for interoperability uh, and looking at bridging mechanisms and how we can uh, enforce data flows um, uh, in the most pragmatic uh, uh, and flexible uh, way possible. So when the global CBPR were um, when the CBPR uh, gl uh, were globalized last year, uh, obviously we were very interested in being part of the conversation. And I think the the, the the UK has a willingness to be open and to kind of you know start the conversation with a wide range of people. We need to work globally to address the global flows. We're in a globalized world. We all have different kind of you know data protection regimes. We need to kind of it, it's complex and, and it's it's a challenge. Challenge, but having um, uh, uh, different people around the table to be able to find solutions is quite, is quite important. So um, as soon as this, uh, there was this new um, status created to be an associate members, um, so just kind of to, um, to kind of clarify here, um, to be a core member of the CBPR, there needs to be a commitment to implement the CBPR into domestic fr uh, framework uh, in the UK because we have uh, the UK GDPR. We are not able to do that, so we're not Im Im able to implement the CBPR system. Um, however, we want to be part of the conversation to think about upgrading the CBPR, to think about the bridging mechanism, uh, and that's why we look for, uh, we kind of apply to be associate members, to be in the room, listening to uh, different uh, countries and kind of expertise and, and, and trying to find a solution. Um, so that's kind of, I've been the approach uh, of the UK and it's going to be continuing to be the approach of the UK. Um, otherwise, we just end up like, you know, being stuck in dogmatism and, uh, and not necessarily finding a common sense uh, solution and really trying to get uh, to help businesses and companies and organizations to be uh, accountable and, and, and compliant. And um, if I may, like bringing up the, the, the discussion a little bit, we've done in all of international engagement we're doing we're applying the same kind of philosophy so for instance with the US um, we've kind of invested a lot in, in um, uh, enhancing and uh, incentivizing uh, the use of privacy enhancing technologies for instance uh, we had a, a the pet sprite challenge we, um, we announced the uh, winners uh, back in March um, we also uh, play a, a key role as part of the OECD to negotiate uh, the principles of uh, uh, government access to data uh, held in the private sector which really provide clarity and transparency and we're basically trying trying to clarify and help kind of um, uh, help businesses comply uh, 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 with the law and, and really kind of taking privacy and data protection at heart and, and really understand the landscape, which is very global, fragmented and, and, and complex. So um, the UK internationally is still going to work uh, with international partners from all, all countries, uh, all from all backgrounds. Uh, we need to be, uh, yeah, we, we, we need to be uh, at this uh, altogether. We can't stay um, at the regional level. Uh, we can't stay within Europe. We can't focus on transatlantic flows, like data flows across borders all around the world, so we need to make sure that we are engaging with everyone. And, and um, one of the questions we addressed while preparing this panel uh, with some of your colleagues was, what about the tools? Do you think that people here in this room should get prepared for some specific tools or specific ways to approach tools that are comparable and interoperable with the existing ones? So from the UK experience, so already um, the ICO has an excellent uh, work uh, or regulator to uh, make some of the tools inter interoperable. So this is very early on, uh, but for instance, um, uh, they have worked on an addendum to the EU SCCs uh, to make sure that if a, if a company is uh, sending data both to the UK and the EU, they are sending uh, one, uh, um, they are using one contract and one tool and not kind of multiple tools in the same way. Uh, we, uh, the ICO has uh, released the international data transfer agreements, which are 
basically the equivalent of the uh, EU SECs. They are multi-party, so again, we're trying to remove uh, contract paperwork, make it easier uh, 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 for companies to use. In terms of upcoming tools, I mean, we are working highly on these issues with the ICO, obviously. It will take some, it's, there are quite like big challenges to face. So as part of the global CBPR forum, as part of the uh, all kind of on uh, thinking and in government, we'll be looking at BCRs, uh, the future of um, IDTAs, at codes of conduct for international data uh, transfers as well, uh, certification. Um, so we're going to use an entire toolbox and look at what we can do and what we can promote. What is in interesting is that with the reform, we have introduced a new power for the Secretary of State, which is the minister, to recognize uh, uh, new tools, either uh, to create new tools or to recognize new tools either in the UK or outside of the UK, because it might be that uh, one day there is this brilliant tool uh, uh, coming up that we would want to recognize and to facilitate data flows. So um, at the moment, we have created the framework to allow for flexibility and interoperability. We are working with this uh, very much in mind, uh, and uh, I'm hopeful that in the next uh, few, you know, years or so, we'll kind of come up with tangible um, solution to to, to progress um, uh, um, these issues. I think it's really interesting because, on, in terms of interoperability, having already in mind that you could, you know, ad adopt somehow and make yours the tools created by others, I think it's really versed into being interoperable and, and defining yourself not only at compliance level, which could be national level, but at global level, which is being interoperable and actually serving transfers aim, you know, core aim. Um, you, you've been touching briefly on pets. Uh, I would like potentially to have some mm -hmm. additional mm -hmm. comments from you and from you, Boyana, also uh, on that. I mean, look, I think, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just coughing so much. <coughs> the pe pets are really part of the accountability uh, toolkit. <coughs> And they are actually those safeguard measures that you put in addition to policies, procedures, controls, training, tools, you know, that you can deploy. I think we haven't explored quite the, the power of pets in the data flow uh, scenario. There are some, yes, encryption, um, yes, um, federated learning, yes, um, on-device, um, even differential privacy. There are many pets that could be used. But I just want to s caution one, two things. First of all, Pets are not a panacea. You don't just say, oh, apply the pets and we don't have to worry about data flows. Well, it doesn't work like that because sometimes you do need data in the personal identifiable format, right? You, you lose the utility of data if you apply pets completely. And secondly, pets are really expensive. They are very, you know, the companies who are developing pets are the the best tech companies in the world, but not, you can't buy them off the shelf. SMEs can't do pets very easily. So, you know, we need incentives and we need recognition that if you're deploying pets, it actually is creating some legal impact and safe harbor so you can then transfer data. Uh, again, UK has got an uh, arrangement with the US so they've, they've put some investment into prizes for pets that are co delivering certain uh, benefits. So I think that is really good. Uh, please, you know, we need to incentivize pets, but again, please be careful, not panacea for everything. So I, um, I just um, bring this remark to the audience. In a few minutes, we will open you know, questions to the floor. So get prepared. And if you have a question, please chime in. Uh, but in the meantime, otherwise, we can keep hours going on because <laughs> it's really so interesting. But let's be interoperable, the one with the others. Based on everything we heard, I would like the panelists potentially to share you know, their thinking and how they think we could be moving forward or what they think is the main constraint they had to face and we should you know, try to alleviate or, or make a little bit less difficult to handle. Um, so based on what we heard and, uh, and, and based on your experience, because it's really what's interesting here, uh, would you like to share some, you know, if not closing remarks, but just, just overall remarks about what we, we just, um, you know, spoke about now? And I don't know, Fabrice, if you want to start. Um, yes, no, it's pleasure. So may, maybe a first observation is that I think everybody uh, agree on the fact that there is a strong convergence on principles, on requirements, and, and it's not new from the Madrid uh, uh, Declaration from 2009, or when you look at the uh, survey which has been done uh, by uh, Article 29 Working Party and APEC on the comparison between the BCR and cross-border privacy rules, you have already extensive comparison, extensive tables, which, uh, uh, which permit to, to consider that it's two types of certification, yeah. but which are based 
on very similar tools, mechanism, uh, requirements. So there is a strong consensus at international uh, levels on the objectives, the principles, and the fact that accountability is really the, the only way to, 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 move, uh, to move forward. M maybe one question is about the resources and, and the availability of, of, of regulators and, and uh, authorities, because the accountability agent as provided by the cross-border privacy uh, rule system uh, present advantages to, to mandate or to delegate to, to, to third party, the monitoring, the oversight, the follow-up of certain aspects of, of, of the, the accountability. So I'm wondering if it would not be interesting to, to explore uh, in more in depth uh, this type of certification. Within GDPR, there is no certification as such of compliance program. That's what you have said, uh, yeah. Boyana. Uh, the certification in practice of compliance program is, as of today, by the incorporate rules. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, uh, authorities have not a, a enough resources to, to, to follow up. And, and that's the reason why it takes a long time to, to onboard uh, groups uh, and, and maybe uh, SMEs uh, on uh, binding corporate rules or, or sim similar uh, uh, tools. So, so maybe one solution could, could be to, to, to think about sort of some delegation not delegation of enforcement, but delegation of a sort of uh, 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 coaching, uh, support, uh, and, and oversight based on a very straightforward referential to, to permit the development of such compliance programs which are expected everywhere and on which there is a strong consensus in all continents as of today. I think it's really interesting, and we go back to this idea. And I, in the OECD report, I noticed that mm. the Canadian example was yeah. raised. I think it's a good one for those not being familiar with it. Wherever you send, wherever you send the data, you have to have the mm. same guarantees, whether it's in Canada, in region, or abroad. Meaning that you don't care really where people stand and are located. You care about a sender having some practices being compliant and assessed, and a receiver having the same standards and the same guarantees. And I think being delocating somehow the problem is really, you know, <coughs> operational and, and, and pragmatic and it goes the same way you, you go. And Okay, thank you. And, and Nicola, have you had some uh, specific points you would like to highlight? Um, um, yeah, just going back to the, the EDPB looking at this interoperability, I'm just thinking back to when I started going to, to the International Transfers Expert subgroup of the EDPB, which is about eight years ago, the first meeting I went to, there was it was on the agenda about the um to to maybe do some kind of work on CBPR BCRs, and then uh, about a month later, Schrems one happened, and then Schrems two yeah. happened, and we've had the yeah, GPF yeah. and yeah. USCCs. So it is a resourcing yeah, yeah. issue, and I know that seems as an excuse, but the practicality <coughs> of there we're very limited. We meet once a month for two days, and in between, then yeah, communicate so by email. Um, so it needs to be pushed up on the agenda, and I think that has to come, as I've said already, externally to us as, as the individual regulators, um, because the willingness is there, I think, and it was, it was there, so to put yeah. it back on the agenda, yeah. maybe we're coming into a, a calmer period, I see. Um, uh, probably not, but uh, that maybe we could uh, push it back up on the yeah. agenda again, but that's, I think, something that, that, that should be looked at. Thank you, and, and please prepare for the questions. You have a mic here. If you don't have questions, we will find. I have plenty, so please <laughs> chime in. Uh, I will give the floor to Morgan um, on, again, what's really interesting f from you, and I hear and, and we observe. I, I mean, I'm a really proactive observer of what UK is doing because it's, um, I think, it's the benefit of, uh, of building on the shoulders of giants. Uh, you have, you know, the state of play, and you know what the extra mile is needed. Um, so. Uh, Based on what we just discussed, do you have some additional points on, you know, a further thinking or what you expect would be your number one challenge or uh, opportunity? Um, what a question. Um, I mean, the, 
the number of opportunities, as you said, like we are building on the shoulders of giant. We still have a, uh, we have all of the learning uh, of kind of having negotiated the DP, the, the Debt Protection Act and the GDPR, having uh, our, our societies and businesses being used of being uh, complying with GDPR as well. So I think for us is um, it's quite an interesting departure point to be able to uh, uh, build on from the GDPR and our compliance and our accountability and our principles and our kind of data protection regime. Um, uh, so there is a massive opportunity to do uh, things a bit differently. Um, I think it would take quite a, t a long time to kind of, you know, get, I think we, we are ready to kind of pilot things, test things, uh, um, uh, and to collaborate nationally uh, with a wide range of stakeholders. I think we are very open uh, uh, to really uh, uh, sending the global stage and having the difficult conversation um, and, and really being proactive in just trying to find innovative solution. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, I mean, the challenges are the fact that we are operating in a very fragmented and, and complex world like when um, it, I mean, I'm responsible for the transfer the uh, assessment of that countries uh, mm -hmm. and to provide kind of data bridges for instance which is a new word that we're using we're not using adequacy anymore um, and this is the reason is because we realize that how different the protection regimes are around the world the, the traditions mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. privacy mm -hmm. and I think it, Part of the challenge and the opportunity is to understand that we uh, uh, we are all coming at it differently, but the outcome, which is uh, 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 um, uh, protecting privacy or, or even uh, ensuring accountability, these are the principles that we can all agree on, share consensus on, and, and, and we can find a way forward. It might take different ways of going about it. I think it's just uh, having the uh, being clever and open and pragmatic and innovative enough to allow for these bridging mechanisms to happen, to allow for the uh, uh, not looking necessarily on the text of the law and copy pasting regimes of mechanisms but looking at like what we're trying to achieve and then build from that and, and, and looking um, from the, the outcome back to the process that we put in place so um, this is going to be the challenge and the opportunities that UK is going to uh, uh, to look at and and it's you, you, you used the words, I didn't, and Boyana didn't. You said bridging mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's beautiful. I, I, I like the term. Yeah. I think it's a, you know, you cannot I'm better summarize. I'm going to patent the bridge <laughs> word. Everybody has to pay me for the bridge every yeah, time yeah. they use it. So because for those, okay. not all enough, uh, the <laughs> first time when we were having reference to this bridging mechanism, it was a discussion, I think it was in Netherlands, mm -hmm. and you've been organizing with uh, CIPOL this discussion. I, I, I have a quick specification. You, you spoke earlier, Morgan, about all those contributions, um, thousands of contributions, were, were there a common denominator in all those contributions or a factor that was like the summit of the iceberg, really visible, stemming from all contributions as a wish or um, you know, some kind of complaint on existing mechanisms? Or was it really partitioned and different and diverse? Um, contribution to consultation. consultation sorry. Ah, the consultation. Um, uh, it was very diverse, actually, and it's 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 the stuff that you hear um, all the time. So uh, business, in, uh, especially SMEs and small businesses, are going to complain about the paperwork, the burden, the fact that it's not easy to navigate international data flows. It's very unstable. Um, so uh, you would have all of this, uh, uh, and the fact that it's kind of stifling innovation, and they can't innovate because they don't even know how to kind of begin with kind of compliance, etc. Um, then obviously you would have a, a civil society, and I mean individuals uh, being uh, um, uh, obviously very uh, keen that we maintain high data protection standards uh, and that we ensure that we can build on the GDPR and not completely uh, reform and change anything. As I said, that we, we, we have uh, data standards that you know people are used to uh, and are complying with, and therefore we are building on, on, uh, on these standards. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's just it, it's the same kind of feedback that we're all hearing in these conferences and outside. I think there are challenges from all sides, uh, and it's kind of as government, it's quite interesting. It, it makes it difficult, but also very interesting to uh, trying to kind of uh, uh, reconcile all of these kind of competing priorities, right? Uh, and I was speaking to the panel yesterday. I think from a government perspective, it's quite interesting where we have several missions, right? We have a mission to maintain the data protection uh, yeah. standards and, and protect the privacy of our citizens. Uh, we also have uh, a, a goal to protect and, and, and uh, uh, the safety of our citizens and national security. We also have a, a, a duty and a desire, means of a, de a desire to promote innovation and, and contrib uh, contribute to growth, uh, especially in the context of a difficult kind of economic uh, situation. So um, 
unfortunately, all of these kind of co uh, goals are competing and not necessarily aligning as the way. So I think the, 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 the big uh, kind of, you know, intention is to reconcile all of these goals and making sure privacy is at the heart of innovation and we're just thinking about responsible data, data use uh, as a heart of the way we're knowing national, national security and uh, um, this is what we kind of contributed to also the OECD um, uh, principles. So uh, it, it's just trying to kind of move forward and clarifying and it's, it's as, as soon as you kind of have this discussion is around a case-by-case -case basis and looking at the different situation uh, and how you could apply uh, privacy interpretation standards in this context. So um, it is complex, but uh, uh, yeah, I think it's just, we, uh, we are in a data-driven world now uh, and societies, yeah. everyone is expecting, yeah. everyone is relying <laughs> on data flows. Even this, most of, of businesses yeah. actually, that's quite, quite interesting, don't even rely they're using international data transfer sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, unfortunately. So it's like bringing awareness, having the discussion, yeah. and just making sure that we catch up with the reality of our world, which is everyone is using data and everyone is transferring data all over the world. Let's make sure that it's safe and protected and, and that we're building a world that we want to yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Boyana, we're going to go to you. And I think it's really interesting to listen to you because I could have been, um, you know, as working for an organization or a company saying the same, we struggle with, um, you know, somehow tipping a balance between diverging interests, which are, you know, business ones and, and strictly compliance one and accountability one and pushing some programs that are, you know, like um, heterogeneous by, by, by definition. So I think it's perfect segue yeah. to Sipol and you, Boyana. Just very good. But by the way, I, I, you know, you're totally right. McKinsey made, made a fantastic um, surveys and, 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 and papers, which are always worth reading on data flows, where they say, 80% of SMEs and startups are born global. So 80% of, of SMEs and startups in the EU, in EU are born global. They need talent, they need technology, they need tools, they need to work with the big players as well to be able to effectuate the market. So you know we mustn't forget that. And that's why we need to solve data flows because we need to boost the economy. But um, you, you, know, you asked us to kind of say what, are the, what, is, what is the good stuff and but some of the challenges. So I hear lots of optimism. And first of all, Fabrice, I mean, you're absolutely right. There is some, some work that we could do. And Nicola, I thank you so much for actually being open. And I think we will probably, Fabrice and I, maybe we'll set up some working group and, and, and kind of, you know, your, your throat, <laughs> EDPB. Um, uh, but, but because I really think there is something to work. But, please, so I'm very optimistic. There is momentum, but, but, look, I mean, we've just had this meta decision, which is, is earth shattering for me, right? And I have to, some people maybe can't talk about it, but I want to say a couple of things about this. I mean, and the first thing is that in some ways, I mean, we have this draconian 1.2 billion fine. I mean, if it wasn't Matt, if it was somebody else, it would, be, it would put them out of business for something that they cannot actually really effectuate because they're in a situation where you've got a potential breach of GDPR, and no matter what accountability mechanism you put in place, it's not good enough because the third country does not seem to provide this essential uh, um, a level of equivalent, so, sorry, essential elements of um, a privacy protection in terms of proportionality, necessity, redress. And so, so, you know, what is the point of all our system and all our rules, SECs, BCR, when you are going to fall foul because in this third country there isn't the quite right um, level for this government access to data. And we're talking about US. I mean, we, what do we do with the rest of the world? I mean, the, my problem with this decision is that what does every other company do? What does every SME do? What do we do for India, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines? That's where data is. That's where the delivery centers are. Brazil, South Africa. Uh, US is just part of the solution. It will be solved because there will be US-EU framework. There will be US-UK framework. I actually don't think this decision would have happened in, e in UK, okay? I mean, that's my point of view. I don't think the regulator would have taken this decision. I think here in Europe we have got this. We've got the draconian fine. And, and I understand what DPAs had to do. They have to say, well, look, the court asked us to, uh, to, to declare that something is unlawful because Schrems happened two years ago. But what is a company supposed to do? What is any company supposed to do? Second point, I worry that we have thrown risk-based approach with the, the bathwater here. We've forgotten that not everything is the same level of, private, of, of risk, severity, likelihood of government access to data when the data is flowing across borders. And, and, and so again, no matter what you do, safeguards in terms of pets, technologies, encryption, SECs, ultimately we judge the, this impossible thing, right, of, of third parties, third countries' law which no company yeah. can affect, can change. 
And the only way to change is governments, right? And that's why we need to support the OECD work. And thank you, UK, for doing that. I know, you know, Europe was at the table with the OECD. This really has to be pushed because we don't have solution. There's going to be another matter and another matter and another matter. I, I hope not because it will be the end of data transfers and we can't do that. But that's really the problem for me because I do believe in accountability. And the EDPB has said, conduct transfer risk assessment, put in, place, put in place safeguards and measures. So they are sort of endorsing in some way risk-based approach. But then, but no matter what you do, it's still not good enough because ultimately, you know, there is the government access to data. So I find this solution untenable. Yeah, and I think this is the reason why when we prepared <coughs> the panel uh, last minute, we were just saying, do we discuss it, you know, substantially or not? And I guess um, our reservation was not on, on what's going on. It's just our topic is accountability. And I think that if you read 222 pages, which I now did, um, it's not accountability that is assessed. No. Uh, it's a different pro problem. So there would be this micro-assessment, uh, which is accountability, and controllers and processors have control on our discussion today. And there would be this macro-assessment, that is the access, unauthorized access, massive access, and justified access, which is beyond the control of any controller or processor. But also the likelihood and severity of that. We can't just work on the basis that things might happen, you know? Because mm -hmm. they don't always happen. They do sometimes, but not always. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there was some report saying that, in fact, the surveillance in the US is, is effectuated, targeted surveillance, about 240,000 people in the world globally. That's not Europeans, that's global people. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but terrorists from countries where terrorists you know, born these days and happen. I'm, you know, I pl please, you know, I'm not p painting any country stars, but I mean, you know, we, we've just heard that um, Google uh, issued a report to say that cybersecurity attacks against NATO countries have increased 300% in the past year since Ukraine war, right? Well, we need to guard ourselves against that. We need to share data for that. And now, and we are worried about government access data in the US mm -hmm. and what the NSA may do to stop that sort of thing. I mean, really, I'm yeah. sorry, I have to be, you, you asked us to be pragmatic. Yes. And I'm telling you as a company, you have to be, be thinking about these things as well. As people yeah. of the countries that you have to be thinking, as government, you have to be thinking True. about and these things. And keep a balance. Exactly. And I want so to refer to an EY I'm stopping study. Stopping ranting because. No, no, but it, it's exactly the point. You have five minutes, and if there are some burning questions, please yeah. stand, because as you see, we, <laughs> we keep going hours. But I, I've been flagging yeah, this, um, uh, this EY study <laughs> with IAP. IPP 2021, in which um, you make the point that 95% of data transfers are supported by SCCs, uh, meaning that the meta decision is not like a residual impact, it's a major in impact. So please. Yeah, good morning. My name is Willem Bochman from the Dutch Ministry of Defense. Um, I would first like to answer your point about the uh, increase in cyber attack. Uh, on NATO countries, from my perspective, yes, we should counter that, but we should always balance the rights of people and uh, privacy is a very fundamental right, also Agreed. in the defense sector. Yes. So we should always Agreed. make a balance between national security and privacy. Um, my question was actually to you, Morgan, about the uh, new UK GDPR, I don't know how you're going to call it. Um, I just Googled it, but 40% of your top 10 trade is with the EU still. Aren't you afraid of losing your um, equity, uh, adequacy decision from the EU with your new regulations? Because what I heard and what I read, that might be one of the consequences of the new pragmatic way. And I think that does not lower the burden for companies, but it only hires the burden for, for the companies in the UK. And let me take the second question, because we have four minutes left. And yeah. We will. yeah, yeah, that was Thank the you. question. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Margo. I'm a bachelor student from Antwerp, and I'm writing my bachelor's thesis about um, BCR and other transfer mechanisms. And I was just wondering about the opinion of the panel on the competitive advantages of companies that do invest in trying to obtain BCRs. Thank you so much for those questions, and I will let you know panelists take their chance.
I will take the first, first, <laughs> first one very quickly. <laughs> uh, thank you for your question. So um, we've designed a, or so is the data protection and digital information bill uh, with uh, you know key data flows in mind, including with the EU. It's an important uh, partner on data flows. Um, from our assessment uh, of uh, so obviously just at first and foremost, um, the adequacy decision is an assessment from the EU of the UK data protection standards laws and practice. Therefore, uh, it's for the EU to assess us uh, or a court if the adequacy was uh, challenged. So it's necessarily for the UK uh, to, 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 to make an assessment. However, uh, we are doing our, our homework and we've assessed about like the, the, the compatibility of our uh, laws and practices uh, with kind of different data flows, including with the EU. And we are comfortable uh, that uh, post-reform uh, um, that we would maintain uh, uh, adequacy decisions from the EU and that our reforms are, com are compatible with adequacy decisions from the, uh, from the EU. It's very important for our businesses and, and, and this is something that we have very much in mind. I think it's important to uh, uh, focus on the fact that, um, first of all, we don't have to have exactly the same uh, laws uh, to, to be found uh, find adequate, like you will have in Japan, New Zealand, other countries have been found adequate by the EU, and the Commission has, 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 has made that clear as well. Um, and that even after post-reform, we will be the regime that is the closest to the EU GDPR. Uh, um, so uh, we are relatively confident that we could uh, maintain data flows. We are maintaining an ongoing uh, uh, relationship and dialogue with the European Commission on our reforms. And, and anything that may impact our, our assessment. Um, so that's kind of the, the UK uh, standpoint on this issue. Thank you, and uh, Fabrice, I know you want to. Yes, thanks, uh, Richard. So to, to the yeah, second I question, I, I think uh, yeah. this year has three life. The first life of this year at the very beginning was to use it as a mere uh, cross-border uh, mechanism to, to permit groups to avoid having to sign hundreds or thousands uh, bilateral yeah. data transfer uh, exactly. agreements. Yeah. That was the first life. The second life of this year was to use this year uh, as a GDPR onboarding yeah, exactly. mechanism. So many clients uh, come to say we, 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 we need to launch accountability within our group. And this year is a good mechanism to, to do it. The current life of this year, and it has been said also by Bayana, is it's a certification uh, mechanism. Because as of today, uh, the ISO 27701, for instance, is not recognized as a certification mechanism uh, under, uh, under the GDPR. Uh, and so uh, as of today, it is a best in class mechanism worldwide. Uh, worldwide and we are very surprised, but sometimes we, we, we meet groups which have only one branch or two affiliates in the EU who have more activities in Asia or, or Middle East and they want to move forward on unbinding corporate rules. So that's the certification uh, mindset or, or, or spirit. So I don't know what will be the next life of, uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of this year, but uh, as of today, it serves as a certification uh, uh, mechanism, I think. Thank you, Fabrice. And I was burning. I couldn't I resist. Must, because <laughs> I want to end on a positive note. I completely agree with you. Are you a data protection officer, Minister of Defense? Is that your role? No. Good. <laughs> I, I agree absolutely with you. We are not saying anything different other than we must ensure both aims. And what I would like to see is more accountability by government and government departments in the way they are managing data. Everybody from the national security to government departments to local governments and so on. Uh, when Privacy Bridges Project was set up by Jakob Konstam, uh, for, yeah. former uh, Data Protection Authority, one of the, pro one of the reports that we did was about <coughs> wanting to see accountability on the side of government when using data for those yes, purposes. Right. Proportionality, necessity, tools, training, uh, minimization. Um, and, and, and so that's what I'd like to see as well. And I think we are, going, we are starting to see that, uh, but we, we need people from that community to start talking about, actually, it's not the Wild West out there. We do comply <laughs> with rules, and here's how we do that. Uh, we're just at SIPL working on a paper, which is, which is just published now, because we're seeing increased requests from local government, municipalities, cities for sharing of data. Data Act is uh, requiring this, DGA is requiring this. So what we're saying, when you do that, you have to think about 
privacy rules on government side and privacy rules on the side of companies who supply that data. Yeah, yeah. It's not free for all. We want to make it accountable. So it's good. Accountability is not that. Marie and it's for everyone. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and you know, governments access data. It's OECD like will solve. French Revolution. Accountability for everyone. Exactly. exactly. Okay, on those brilliant remarks, I will, <laughs> I will just thank, and I'm really grateful for the quality of the discussion. Thank you so much to the speakers.